because they don't have that body awareness. Right. And that's another thing that can help turn down that pain response and those pain signals is better body map, a better body awareness. And so that's where balancing coordination things come in. Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to Catalyst for Change podcast uh, with your professional health and fitness team. And I'm here with a regular member of that team, Dr. Jeffrey O'Gunn, who runs O'Gunn Chiropractic Wellness and Rehabilitation in Kirkwood. And he also is unique in that he has a personal training facility attached to his practice. It's called Embody. So, I mean, the guy knows his stuff and my name is Jim Adams and I am the owner of Catalyst Personal Training in University City uh, and I am your host. And today with Dr. Ogun, we're going to be talking about pain, as Clubber Lane would say in the old Rocky movies. Um, again, I'm dating myself, but today we're going to be talking about when you move well say like if you have some movement deficiency and you clean it up and you're still in pain. And doc, you say this is something you talk to your patients all the time about, right? Absolutely, because it can become so frustrating for anybody who goes to any therapist, a physical therapist, chiropractor, whoever it might be. And hey, you need to correct your posture. You need to correct your form or whatever it is. And they do all those things. And then, yeah, I'm still in pain. So I have really, I really talk about it a lot because if somebody has seen somebody before me and they come in, that's where I really, it's almost half of the education that they need so that they can understand, okay, that makes sense. All right, now, now I know maybe some other strategies and some things I can do about it. And in some cases, and I hate to say live with it, you wanna minimize it as much as possible but sometimes if there is that little background noise of, yes, that, there's this reminder that I had an injury there, it's, it's easier to accept when you understand it and say, okay, well, here are the things I can do about it. And I'm not alone. This is something that is real. People experience this and you can just tolerate it better. Yeah. So can you give, give us like an example uh, or, you know, you know, staying within HIPAA guidelines and everything, but like, say, if you've had any uh, patients that have come to you in this situation, what, what are some of the other factors of pain other than movement, like pain-free range of motion? What are some of the act other factors of pain that you have to pay attention to? Yeah. So, I mean, and really, you know, we kind of just pain is really, if we wanted to define it, it's just an unpleasant sensory response. It's heavily tied into our, um, mindset, our emotions, and all of these other things. So what you're describing, you know, what is going to cause pain for most people, the classic textbook examples, I touch a hot stove, it sends an impulse into my uh, nervous system along those nerve pathways, into my spinal cord, up these nerve pathways, and then into my brain. But it's always registered in the brain. And most of the time, pain has an injury component. So you know, I use the example of the hot stove or the fire, whatever it is. In the case of an injury, let's say a back, a hip, a shoulder, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. it's a that the tissues in that area have been injured. Maybe they've been torn, a torn rotator cuff, torn labrum. Maybe there's tendinitis. Ten, yeah, <laughs> you know about pain very well. Uh, uh -huh. Tendinitis, tendinosis, arthritis, disc bulges, you know, whatever the region is. But the tissue's injured, that injury is sending impulses in through the nerve pathways, in through the spinal cord, up into the brain, and it's being registered as pain. Now, here's a bunch of other things that can happen. Um, there are things called sensitization. One is called central sensitization. That's where the pain experience is just heightened along those nerve pathways. And this can happen in people sometimes, especially, and this is where chronic pain comes in. They don't necessarily have that injury anymore, or the injury is healed for the most part. But the nervous system pathways that the pain uh, used to travel on, the pain's still traveling there. Here's a great example, phantom limb pain. Mm. So, uh, uh, somebody gets a limb cut off. And they go to or the doctor. paralysis. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. with paralysis. Yeah. 
and says, hey, my fingers hurt. And it's, and somebody says, laugh at him, say, you ain't got no fingers. I hate to tell you this, you don't have fingers. It right. feels like my hand is on fire where my hand would have been. There's right. a great example. And how are you, are you gonna rehab that through finger exercises? You don't have fingers. And so there's a good example of, okay, I've heard of phantom limb pain. Yeah, that, okay, okay. What, well, what is that? What's, how do they have that pain? It's the pain pathways. So in the spinal cord and in the brain, those, that, those brain centers, those pain centers that used to um, go up from where the hand was, well, that pain experience is still there in the brain. And so that's an example of something that we would call central sensitization. They call it central because it's in the central nervous system. It's a pain experience in the brain. Uh, people with fibromyalgia, they used to tell people with fibromyalgia, oh, it's all in your head. And in a way they're right, it's an insensitive way to say this, but in a way they're right because their brain pain centers are very heightened. So I think that's an important component to, to understand is there's this, you know, those pain pathways can still be going. And it, it, this can be somebody can have the most perfect form in the world. But if they've got pain pathways that are registering pain, pain, pain into the brain, it really doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter what their movement is. Now, we should talk about exercise and exercise prescription and come back to that. Those are good examples. And then one other one is something called peripheral sensitization. And this is where that you see this a lot in arthritis, degenerative disc disease. Um, and this is a case where the body has really uh, put this drastic, dramatic response in putting more nerve fibers down in that area. So when, we, when there's an old injury, you know, arthritis is the best example of this. Well, sometimes the body starts to lay down these little nerve receptors and not just any nerve receptors, but pain nerve receptors. And so they're extremely sensitive in that area. And so mm -hmm. just doing regular exercises, even with, with, with a pretty good form, there's still this hyper awareness of, yeah, that's where the pain was in through there. Mm -hmm. So those are good examples of, okay, now I'm starting to see form people I, I you've seen kid i mean you've been a kid before i've been a kid mm -hmm. i had horrible form i did curls for the girls and <laughs> i didn't do deadlifts and if i did do a deadlift it would have been the most horrible form because i would have just wanted to get as much weight up as i could uh -huh. and i would get away with it too because i don't have an injury so you see the opposite you know somebody with horrible form it's like that should hurt you does that hurt you no it doesn't hurt me i feel fine i feel great uh -huh. and so Form sometimes doesn't necessarily relate to pain. Okay, gotcha. So, so the pain is definitely it, your your nervous system, spinal cord, brain is designed to register pain. That's and, it, and, and it's a useful thing because it's like hot stove. Oh, I better take my hand off there because if I leave yeah. it on there, the injury is going to get worse and worse. I'm going to, you know, lose my skin. So pain serves a purpose, but, Absolutely. but in certain cases it gets so sensitive that it almost is not serving that same purpose. So, cause this nervous system has gotten so sensitive to it. And I didn't know that about like a chronic injury or like arthritis or degenerative disc that your body lays down additional pain receptors. It makes sense if that, if they're always, if pain's always coming from that area that your body's going to want and want more information about it. Right. You, that's, that's perfect. The way you said that, because that's exactly why it does it. It wants more information. The body's kind of saying there's an injury here. I need more information. So let me make it more sensitive in through there. It's just the unfortunate part of that is, there's a hyper awareness of that area and where that injury is. Got it. So how do you, how do you begin to reverse that process? So here's where people like you and I and in, in movement, movement is one of the best things that people can do because we can't adapt. Now it's choosing now, and let's actually go back to the, um, the form. So even though form isn't necessarily a driver of pain, we said people with horrible form can be pain-free and people with perfect form can still experience that pain. There's still some rules of thumb. 
uh, you know, we're talking about the deadlift. I mean, keeping a neutral spine, core engaged, good brace around that, move through the hips, a good hip hinge. All of that stuff is still extremely important because for most people, having improper form over a period of time is going to create more wear and tear on certain tissues. You're going to stress more tissues. So in no means, in no way am I trying to say form doesn't matter, throw it all for future injuries. Now, one of the things that you want to do, let's say for those uh, sensitization is the body can adapt. And a lot of people, what happens is they've got something called fear avoidance, which is I have pain. I don't want to move at all. In the research and the literature shows, no, actually what you do want to do is you want to move it and you want to start to adapt to stresses. Um, so you want to find out here's what usually bothers my back bending over and picking up my kids. And so what you, there's a case where you would want to say, we want to add some deadlifts into your routine, but we want to do it in a slow graded progressive manner and monitor every step of the way. And sometimes you have to have that conversation with them when they say that hurts, describe that pain to me on a scale of one to 10. What is it? And when they start saying things like, well, I just feel it. I'm aware of it. Okay, so you said hurt, but now you're kind of saying you're aware of it. On a scale of one to 10, how aware are you? A three or a four? That's okay. That I'm, I'm okay with that because what we want to do is get those tissues to adapt, to become more resilient. And that means we're going to have to slowly, uh, progressively load those tissues. But every step of the way, we want to help them monitor that. So that's you know one thing that you want to do right there is movement. And sometimes it doesn't matter. I used to be really big on what's the most perfect exercise and the most perfect protocol for every patient. And what I'm, it, as I do this longer and longer and what I think I get better at it, what I'm realizing is sometimes it doesn't matter too much. There are definitely some great exercise selections and choices. And within this group of exercises, just get them doing those things. Yeah. Just get yeah. them to move. Yeah. And I, that makes sense because I know when you have like a, like a psych psychological pain, right? Like say, yep. if you're definitely afraid of rabbits, right? <laughs> then, you know, the way to get you over there, that is to gradually expose you to rabbits. So you start far away where you know you're safe and then they gradually bring the rabbit closer to you until your brain figures out and your nervous system figures out, okay, I'm safe. So that makes the same, it's the same philosophy for movement, right? So if you've had like extra nerve fibers down or that uh, pain pathway is really sensitive, then putting movement over it slowly and graduated range of motion and everything like that, then that grat that uh, eventually gets your body over that pain signal. Is that about right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I like how you kind of would talked about the psychological aspect because for a lot of people, they need to understand that, you know, the, the brain is that pain center and that volume of pain. I, I tell my patients, you know, you, you can think of like a volume knob and that pain can be turned up. It can be turned down. And there are things like cognitive behavioral therapy. Some of my clients, they have what are called yellow in the, in the world of rehabilitation. Uh, there's something called yellow flags. And these are predictors that people are going to have a more challenging time with rehabilitation. And it's, it's all psychological stuff. It's stuff like uh, the fear avoidance is one of them. People that constantly talk about, I can't do this. It's going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. That's a psychological component that you need to be aware of. Depression, anxiety. Uh, there's even something, uh, passive coping is another one. So that's where people, somebody in chronic pain depends on somebody like me that does manual therapies and says, well, I need somebody else to fix me. I can't fix myself. Somebody has to align my spine. You know, they come in and say, I feel like I'm out of whack and I need you to realign my spine. But they keep saying that over and over. We do the adjustment. Oh, I'm still out of alignment. And you start to try to get them to, to take over a little bit of the care themselves and get them to move and like, oh, no, 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 you need to fix me first. It's yellow flag. It's psychological. And some people need counseling. They need cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, that makes that makes sense uh, to me, like taking on it's like taking ownership of your health and fitness, you know, like, uh, 
Um, if you've got, you know, diabetes, type two diabetes, you know, going to the doc is not going to fix you, right? It's going to keep you functioning and it's going to keep you from getting sick or sicker, but it's not going to cure the diabetes. You're going to have to change your lifestyle a little bit, right? You're going to have to take control and change your lifestyle. And so it's the same with physical pain that comes from movement, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned, because you were talking about the the volume of pain, where does sleep affect that? How does sleep affect that? It's fantastic. I, um, rest is essential for recovery and with poor sleep, lack of sleep. Sleep's like a huge topic right now. You hear it over and over as sleep specialists. People mm-hmm. are taking sleep more seriously. It used to be like, I'm just going to grind through the day. And that's what, mm-hmm. that's what a business. Down some about. Starbucks or some yeah, Red Bulls yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And it's really starting to realize like, no, actually sleep is really important, but for pain management, extremely important because there's, it's going to help us have a more optimal uh, hormone profile when we get mm-hmm. good sleep. It's going to help us reset our nervous system. We said that the nervous system is the driver of the the pain pathways. That's the the, the pathways that pain travels. And so, yeah, if we can keep that at a lower threshold, we need that rest and we need that recovery and we need that sleep. So that's a a huge thing. And then people that don't get good sleep, they usually have more anxiety and or more depression uh, in all of these things. And these are things that are driver, they turn up that volume of pain. So yes, sleep is important. So can you explain to the listeners like the, the, uh, the mechanics behind why sleep resets the nervous system? I am not a sleep specialist. I don't even oh, Okay, gotcha. I don't okay. Even want to try to touch that. Um, I, I just know that when you get adequate sleep and you uh-huh. get good sleep, the smart people, the people smarter than me and the researchers. I mean, and that's, and you know, mate, and I don't even know how well they would explain it. That's just what our research shows, you know, yeah. it, people's nervous systems seem to function better. They're, they, and they've done studies, their hormone profiles are better mm-hmm. when they sleep more. And so these are all things that are going to, we're just going to function better. We're going to, we're going to function smoother, but they do show that, yes, those, the, the pain experience is less in people. Uh, people with chronic pain when they get good rest. And I usually just keep it as simple as, you know, rest is your recovery. It's essential for recovery. So if you're not mm-hmm. resting, meaning getting good sleep, your body's not recovering. Yeah. And uh, like you said, when you get better sleep, it's been proven study after study that your hormone profile and your cortisol, your cortisol, which is a stress hormone yes. is much lower. Um, and then your blood glucose is your insulin resistance is much lower, which makes it easier for you to lose weight, harder for you to gain weight, easier for you to eat healthier because you have less cravings, um, things like that. So when I hear that, what I think of is because everybody is always looking for that one thing, that panacea, that magic bullet that's going to fix everything. But the way I look at it is everything is is multifactorial, right? It's like just focusing on the violins and the orchestra. If you just focus on the violins, the violins are going to sound great. The rest of the orchestra may sound like crap, right? So you have to work on the whole orchestra and how it interplays. And that's what makes the music sound really good. So it's the same thing when you're talking about pain and getting out of pain and uh, taking better care of your health and fitness, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, have you listened or read uh, Atomic Habits yet? I'm, I'm I have. Mm-hmm. Habit. And I like, it was somewhere in the middle of the book though, and he kind of talked about what they did, the, the cycling uh, team that was horrible. And they said, let's not shoot for any one big thing, but here's this little component, this, and sleep was one of them. Mm-hmm but let's make sure they get good rest, good sleep. And let's fine tune this and let's fine tune this. And we're going to get a 1% improvement probably on each of these things. And 1% doesn't mean much, but when we do 20 of these things with a 1% improvement, that could be a 20% jump in our um, 
uh, pro productivity or how well we do. And I think that's exactly what you were saying. I mean, that's, that's right on with anything health and wellness related. There's not that one magic thing. It's, it's a, it's multifactorial, like you said. Okay. And, and it's also important to, to, to point out that sometimes, you know, um, people are, I mean, everybody's in pain for legitimate reasons. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to be in pain, right? But in some people, but there are times when you have injuries where you just got to stop and let it recover, right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no such thing as working through the pain or anything else. So at what point do you start to um, differentiate between like, an injury pain versus like you were saying, some of the phantom pain, some of the, what do you call it? Sensitization um, and, and other sources of pain or like extra nerve fibers being laid down in an area where there's a chronic injury. How, at what point do you differentiate between like a, an acute injury pain versus like a chronic pain like that? Yeah, usually based on, I, I just try to do my questioning for my patients in a way that they're going to tell me, I mean, I'm, it's because pain is subjective. So I don't feel what they feel. So kind of like you said, the acute is going to be usually the more sharp pain, the more recent, if there was a, an injury. So if somebody comes in and I bent over this way and they described their technique, which was a lot of lumbar spine flexion with rotation. And as soon as I did it, I heard a snap. And now they're buckled over and they're standing kind of off to one side. I'm, that's a very easy case to say, that's acute. We're not going to go in the back and start doing deadlifts right now. We're going to put some stem on it. We're going to put some ice on it. I'm going to, I'm probably not going to stretch the area when people have a, an acute muscle spasm. It usually doesn't do exceptionally well to work in that area that day. It's better to let it rest, put the ice on there, but to stretch around it. I start stretching some hip flexors, some piriformis muscles and those kinds of things. They usually do well. Some of them do well with the spinal manipulation, but I'm going to stick more with my manual therapies and all of the passive therapies for them. And then what I'll do is monitor how are they moving and, you know, can you squat? Can you bend over? Can you do this? And when they start saying things like, it's not so sharp anymore, it used to grab me every time I would bend this way. It was like, I, like it just pulled, it grabbed. It was an immediate, mm -hmm. like almost buckled me, a little mm -hmm. tear in my eye. And then when they start saying more things like, now it's just this annoying stiffness, it's tight, it's achy, but they've got that range. Now we can start to say, hey, let's start doing maybe some just basic bird dogs or dead bugs, the, all the McGill stuff and the floor exercises and then progressively load them through. And then for the chronic ones, but now some people might come in with chronic pain. I always have this pain. I live with it. It's worse in the mornings. It's, it, you know, after I sit too long and I get up for somebody like that, I, I might completely skip all of those other things and say, let's go in the back and let's look at your hip hinge. And I'm going to have you do a deadlift with this 35 pound kettlebell. You're crazy. Yeah. You want me to do? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I am crazy, but I have to really success with this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I am crazy, and yes, I want you to do that. <laughs> yes, I'm crazy, and I want you to do this. I uh, I had a woman who was just chronic pain, chronic pain, and we had her. We're doing trap, you know. Usually with somebody like this, do trap bar deadlifts, and she was very. She does yoga all the time, and I explained to her your small muscles along your spine called the multipedis muscles. They are atrophied. You got to get those stronger. You got to get the circumference of those muscles bigger. And we went and did deadlifts and she was very suspicious, you know, wasn't quite on board, but we did it twice a week for six weeks. And, it, and she was, she was in her early, late sixties, early seventies. And oh my gosh, she, after six weeks was like, I don't know if my back has felt this good in years. I don't remember the last time I felt this good. And so those are cases where, yeah, go in there and let's work it. You know, okay. we, we got we to progressively, we got to get it to adapt. Yeah. So like everything else, it depends. So make sure that you get yourself educated and learn as much as you can and, and find somebody that can help you, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And somebody who's, yeah, willing to think outside the box sometimes. Mm -hmm. And for somebody with chronic pain, I think the big thing is, like I said, that fear avoidance, they really do need to move more. Maybe they need help with their form or maybe they need somebody to help them choose a different 
type of exercise. Um, the reason that I opened up the studio and you know we added the personal training is because I found most chiropractors don't load tissues enough. They do. They just focus on the passive therapies and that's it. Um, and then what we found is a lot of physical therapists, um, they still don't go to that level of necessarily like kind of integrating more the stuff that you do, the functional, like uh, almost athletic training mm -hmm. types of things. Yeah, they don't cross that threshold where it causes changes to the tissue. Yeah, and I don't want to mm -hmm. put anybody in a box or cat, you know, I, uh -huh. because there are some that do, but that's kind of why we did this is like, we, we have really good success with taking it to that next level. Yeah, so why does loading the tissues help it stick more? So the analogy that I like to use, and it's not that every injury is like this, but tendinosis, I think is a really good analogy. And that's things like your golfer's elbow, your, um, your tennis elbow, even things like plantar fasciitis. But what it is, is the collagen fibers have, we've got collagen fibers and the more densely packed they are, close, closely wound together they are. Uh, and the more that there are, the stronger a tissue is. And what happens in these tendinosis cases is they unravel a little bit. They get a little bit looser. Mm -hmm. The type of collagen fiber is different. They're, th they're thicker, but they're not as strong. Uh, I like to use a rope analogy. If you've got mm -hmm. a rope that's kind of shredded and like, you know, fibers and strands just hanging and, you know, uh, hanging out a little bit, you're like, eh, yeah, that's not the rope I want to climb up. The one that's really densely packed, you're like, yeah, that looks Great, strong yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. So we do know for sure, like the research shows over and over, loading those tendons is what's going to get them stronger. So the case of, let's say, the, uh, the tennis elbow is you take a weight and you do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The same thing with uh, jumper's knee. They find that doing squats are one of the best things that you can do for that patellar tendonitis or tendinosis. They call it tendinosis now. They used to call it tendinitis. But those are some of the best things that you can do, and it makes it more resilient. And I think the same thing is happening along the spine. You're making tissues more resilient when you do certain exercises, when you take it up to that next level, like a deadlift. It doesn't have to be a deadlift. That's just the examples I continue to give today. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, but it's going to make the muscles back there, those, the multifidus muscles we talked about in the case of the deadlift, it's going to, that's what's going to really get them stronger in there. They don't, you don't need to train them in a way that they're going for personal records. You know, you're not going for a, a one rep max for somebody, mm -hmm. some, somebody like that. You want them to put in about 60 to 70% effort though, or build up to a 60 to 70% effort um, and maybe do reps of four to six so that they can experience a little bit of a heavier weight. Again, that's going to be progressive. You don't start there, but that's what right. you would want to build up to for a more resilient spine and more resilient tissues. Yeah. And that's a good point that you just mentioned that, um, like the percentage of like their, their exertion levels, because I, I feel like a lot of people when they start to strength train an area, especially if they're rehabbing it, they don't, they don't, they don't stress the muscle enough to cross a threshold where the muscles like, oh, man, I'm gonna have to, you know, you know, I'm gonna have to get in shape if I'm gonna, if we're gonna be doing this on a regular basis, right? Yep. That's it. Yeah. yeah so how do you, so what's a, what's a good uh, indicator of when you're, when you're heavy enough to cross that threshold to cause physiological changes in the muscle? And through there, and that's kind of the, the same thing we talked about before with, with pain, there's some subjectivity to it. Now there is, it is fun. I like that question because I used to say, well, that's entirely subjective, but now I can watch somebody and be like, <laughs> On a scale of one through 10, how challenging was that for you? Oh, that was like a nine. Well, it didn't look like a nine. It looked like a three or a four because you lifted that up pretty darn easily. Instead right. Of that. Gotcha. Now, yep. For somebody who's not experienced with lifting, it's like it felt like a nine or an eight or a nine to me because I've never lifted 75 pounds before. Got so, it. So that felt heavy, but they did it just fine. Um, in through there. So I think two things, the subjective component is really, really important and ask them what I usually do is on a scale of one through 10, how challenging was that? Meaning a zero or a one was that wasn't challenging at all. And a 10 was, there's no way I could have lifted in uh, one more pound. There's no way I could have done one more set uh, yeah. with that there. So you'll kind of get the subjective. 
Now, in the beginning phases of rehab, maybe you try to keep it at a five mm -hmm. as you progress and you've monitored and they've come back every other day or so and say, no, that didn't bother me. I felt fine. Maybe I was, a, you, how sore were you and did it cause any pain? And you get enough green lights in through there that, no, it didn't cause any pain. I wasn't sore. I was the perfect amount of soreness. Maybe we can progress it and get it up to a seven, maybe even in some cases an eight out of a 10. Um, for spine health purposes, it doesn't really need to go beyond that. Again, you don't have to do crazy personal records or anything like that. Now they might want to, they might say, I kind of like this stuff and I want to go more because this is fun and enjoyable now. Yeah, get those endorphins rolling. Yeah, exactly. You get the endorphins mm -hmm. rolling, but then objectively too, I'm going to, did they break form? Did they, you know, what did the exertion level look like to me on my end? And I'll marry those two things together. What am I seeing? What are they telling me? And we'll go from there. And there's an art to that. As you know, you've been a trainer right. for a long time. There's an art to it. Yep. Yeah. There's the science and then there's the art. Yep. The science is easy. The art yep. takes some time. It does. Yeah. It, the communication and making people feel comfortable and all of those things. Yeah. That, that all of those things play into it. Yeah. So this has been great. Uh, I know I've learned a lot uh, and I, I think the listeners have too. So you have any parting uh, advice that you would give someone who has looked at their movement and looks clean, but they're still in pain. Yeah, I would, uh, movement variety is big for me. Most of the people that might be listening are all already aware of that. But, you know, I talked about the person who was doing yoga and then we fixed her back pain with deadlifts. Now it can go the other way too. Somebody right. can be a power lifter in an extreme pain is like, you need to work on some balance, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't stand on one leg for, and, and actually balance is really important. Balance coordination, people that constantly throw out their back or they get muscle spasms, uh, the balance component, how long can you stand on one leg? Can you, you know, I, I, I always joke, like there's so many different things that are all the same movement, a uh, single leg RDL, or you could call it a warrior three pose and put your mm -hmm. arms up in the air and all this stuff. But those are really important things. The hip airplanes, I do hip airplanes a lot in my practice. Are you, I'm sure you're familiar with the hip airplanes. Yep. And mm -hmm. They're I hard. Yeah. They're hard for a lot of people. Yeah. Really to get hard. conceptually. Yeah. Because they start moving their head and doing all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff because they don't have that body awareness. Right. And that's another thing that can help turn down that pain response and those pain signals is better body map, a better body awareness. And so that's where balancing coordination things come in. So movement variety could be really important. If you're focusing on strength training, maybe you need to do more balance and agility and yoga type of work. Maybe you need to work on your mobility a little bit. Um, and, and I'm sure you you already do this. I do this. Um, where we do movement variety. We start off with a warm up. We do kind of um, as some athletic training. Then we do some strength training, and then we do some hit training. So we always try to have that movement variety in there. But yeah. I think that would be important. Don't worry so much about perfect form and sometimes perfect form gets overwhelming like oh shoot if i'm am i doing this doing that sometimes cut yourself some slack and just move your body in new ways yeah i like that i like that quite a bit uh because a lot of people will it's like um repetitive motion injuries yeah if all you do is run you know then all the time that all the time then those movements are gonna you know wear out right yep. so you have to change it up um, so I agree with that. It's like, um, uh, I don't, I'm a big hockey guy, as you know, and, uh, Henrik, uh, Lundqvist, one of the, the goalies in the NHL who recently retired, but they asked him like, uh, what are you doing the off season to train? He says, I play tennis. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, and he, and he explained why is like he said, movement variety. He's like, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what I do when I play in the season. So I want to kind of let those muscles and those movements recover, those joints recover, those tissues recover. And, but still at the same time, get my exercise, my movement, my bit mobility, my cardio, things like that. So it's good to change it up. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. You know, I like to use the example of, uh, you know, a dietitian was like, hey, you know, what's really healthy for you spinach. I think you should eat spinach all the time. Just eat spinach, you know, tell everybody just eat spinach. And you'd be like, wait, aren't there these other things called like proteins and fats? Like, don't I need some of that? And like, and that sounds ridiculous and silly, but if you're exercising for health reasons, then you want that movement variety. And like you said, if you're running one dimensionally all of the time with no lateral movement, 
let's throw some grapevines in there, the karaoke right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, some multi-directional movement. You know, mm -hmm. Or some yoga or Pilates or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Doc. Well, as always, man, this has been phenomenal. I always enjoy talking to you. I always uh, learn something. And I'm sure the listeners do too. I'm so glad you're on the team. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this. And yep, we'll see you. Uh, you know, maybe a month. I know you, you reach out to me. So let me know what you want to do next and we'll do yeah. it. I'm here. Yeah. We'll have you on, on next month for sure. And the, right. and the boardroom looks great. <laughs> Thanks, sir. It's a lot more realistic than mine. <laughs> All right. I'll see you. All right, doc. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. <laughs>